scripture reading will be taken from 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 6 through 9 1 Peter 1 verses 6 through 9 In this you greatly rejoice even though now for a little while if necessary you have been distressed by various trials so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not been have you sorry, and though you have not seen him, you love him, and though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith and salvation of your souls. Good morning. We have a number that are visiting with us. We are very thankful that you are, are here. It's good to be back. Antoine Holloway said hello to those that said hello to him. It is uh, always wonderful, though, to come back home, worship with a brother in here at West Mason. And so if you're visiting with us, again, you're our honored guest. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them. Our goal is to get to heaven and, and certainly would appreciate your help with that. And we would love the opportunity to help you. We studied First Peter a couple of months ago. And one of the things that kept coming up in that book is the word precious, and I want to talk a little bit about that this morning. It's with our perspective. Now, if you're a Lord of the Rings fan, anything precious, it's a little different perspective than what you have. Except, what was precious to him is what's precious to a lot of people. Whether it's power, whether it's just nice jewelry, Whatever it is, there's something that is precious to us. And the amazing thing to me about the book of 1 Peter, what we are told is God's view of what's precious, and therefore what our view needs to be of what is precious. And so as we go through this, the idea is to see, as Bob talked about at the, at the table, what is our perspective? Is it the same, or do we view things as God does? In a book that is written to people who are going to suffer tremendous persecution. Tremendous persecution. Beyond anything that I can comprehend when you read about some of the, the stories about people in the first century and the persecution they went, in, went through. Just the apostles and some of the things that they go through. Horrible persecution. Being thrown in as gladiators, as an example not volunteering and understanding the horrible things that they would have gone through. That's when this is written. So Nero is in charge. He's in power. And as Jonathan did just an excellent job of teaching on this book, made it very, very clear that Nero treated Christians. He used Christians as the scapegoat. He needed somebody to blame. And the Christians were the one. And so you have this book that is written and it talks about truly what is precious. Beginning in verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with a joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Is your faith precious to you? 
why is faith precious to you? Or is it? It is to God. In verse 7, one of the most fascinating things to me is the word precious being used to describe faith, and then it uses gold to make the point. You see, gold to a lot of people is precious. But perhaps maybe to you, we can understand in situations where we realize how precious time is or how precious memories are. We can realize certain situations and we understand truly what is precious. These brothers and sisters in Christ in the first century understood how precious faith was at this point. They were going to be persecuted. There were things that were taken away from them and they had a choice to make. Am I going to continue to live in a relationship with God, or am I going to turn? And what does it say? Even though you don't see him, you believe in him, you love him, and you have a joy that's inexpressible, full of glory. You understand the big picture of things. And so when you think about these verses in 1 Peter, the first chapter, 3 through 9, it's the idea that we are so blessed by God, even in the midst of horrific persecution. Or difficult circumstances that we may find ourselves in. But faith. I'm not sure a lot of people view faith to be precious. You know, it's interesting to me in, in a couple of different verses that I'll put up there. In Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse 11 through 12, is this idea about blessed are those who are persecuted. Blessed are those who go through all these difficulties. Why? Because you have the kingdom of heaven. It's worth it. It's worth going through those things. When you think about Romans, the fifth chapter, verse one through five, and the idea that is given there that faith that you have and the persecutions and difficulties that you go through is going to lead to something. It's understanding the purpose as to why we go through those things leads to peace as we have in God. But it also, as we go forward, uh, at least in knowing the tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance, proven character and proven character, hope and hope does not disappoint. Our faith is should be one of the most precious things that we have. We obviously understand the other things that we've talked about, but it's faith that's going to determine where we spend eternity based on the other things we're going to talk about. Amen. This faith that we have is not based on whether or not we're going through difficulties or the struggles that we go through, it's not something that we put down or pick up simply based on circumstances. It is so precious to me that it's not even, to, to compare it to gold is not even fair. It is so great that I can understand in verse 9 of chapter 1 of 1 Peter that we obtain as the outcome of our faith the salvation of your souls. Our relationship with God how precious is it to you? Now he goes on in this chapter and he'll talk about you need to be prepared. You need to learn to be holy as your God is holy. There's a lot of things that we need to learn about our relationship with God. It's more than just saying it. One of the things that's so interesting to me over throughout the pandemic that we would have conversations before that if I was in the first century and I would absolutely would have a relationship with God, the persecution that they go through, nothing would stop me with that relationship with God. And then COVID hit, and I had a choice to make. And some people chose poorly, and still are choosing poorly. You had a choice to make. Nothing would stop me in the first century. They could put me in boiling oil, and I would never turn against God. They would take my card away that allows me to get food if I was not willing to deny God, as they did in the first century. And I would stand for truth. And then COVID hit. You know, it's fascinating to me how often, as I've talked about many times, a lot of us are David until a Goliath is standing in front of us. Until something we're struggling with. And then our minds stop focusing on the God that was with David, that is with us in our relationship with him, and focus on the persecution or the giant or the struggle that we have. And we forget God. It is so precious. It needs to be so precious to us that there is nothing that is going to keep me from my relationship with God. 
That's what you see in the first century Christian. That's what Peter is telling the people in the first century. So much so, he'll go on and say, you need to be holy. Why? Because God is holy. You strive for holiness in all your behavior, even in the midst of horrible persecution. My brothers and sisters, we are so blessed in this country. One of the great persecutions that we deal with is imagination. Things that we make up and persecute ourselves by the what if instead of what truly is happening. There are difficulties. There are darknesses. But go read about the first century Christians who stood up for God in the midst of horrible, horrible things. And it says here with joy that was inexpressible and full of glory, knowing that they have salvation. That's the relationship I want to have with my God. That's the relationship we all need to strive to have with our God. What about the precious blood of Jesus? You know, it's interesting as you continue on in this chapter to really consider, as we talk about often, what God did for us. You pick up in verse 17. If you address the Father as the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct, conduct yourself in fear during the time of your stay on earth knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile ways of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as a lamb of unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. The precious blood of Christ. He'll go on and continue talking of this. Is that the way that we view his blood? The precious blood of Christ. You know, when it's my blood, it's really, really precious. Have you ever gone and given blood? And I'm not talking about you know, volunteering. If you have to give blood for a medical thing, I'm not too sure how much blood they need in some cases. But it's amazing. And the thought of, I'm not sure I'm able to walk out of here. It took so much blood. They know, obviously. I don't. How much they can take. But blood is precious. And we understand that from our perspective. When you get a cut, we understand blood. Some of us faint, but we understand the value of it. This precious blood of Jesus is on a whole other level of precious. That God would say, I did not give you something simple and perishable as silver and gold. You know that thing that you view to be precious? I gave you the precious blood of Jesus Christ. The precious blood of Jesus Christ. One of the things from my perspective that growing in maturity has, has taught me is that when we partake of the Lord's Supper, one of the things I can never stop thinking about is how precious that blood was. It is so amazing what he has done for me, for you. And how often we get caught up just going through the motions. I try to use a funeral or memorial service of any sort as an example. I don't need somebody to remind me if somebody close to me passes away. All the amazing things that they have done to me. They're precious to me. That's the way Jesus Christ is. He needs to be precious to us. That he died for you. Over in Hebrews, the ninth chapter, we talked about this a few weeks ago in the uh, Holy Spirit class. But I love these verses because ultimately it's talking about the old versus the new. It's talking about Jesus' death and the fact he was willing to die for us, for those who eagerly await him as this chapter will end. But I want you to notice the eternal pieces of this. Beginning in verse 11, he says, But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For with the blood of, of goats and bulls and ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, 
Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. For this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Did you catch the eternals? The eternal redemption that is offered in verse 12. The eternal spirit. That means the Holy Spirit. This is God's plan of what was going to happen. They were united in this plan. And to give us an eternal inheritance. An eternal inheritance that is found in Jesus Christ. This precious blood. That there is blood. There, that is no blood anywhere else that is able to do this. He is our God. It is his blood. That cleanses us from all sin. How precious is that to you? Now we can sit here in church buildings and say, of course his blood is precious to me. Okay. Well, what about Monday through Saturday when we choose to sin? Which is why he died in the first place. How precious is it then? The whole point of this isn't that we're going to continue to sin as Romans will say, that grace may abound. The purpose is that we understand how precious this blood is, that he's given us this opportunity, and therefore I'm going to live for him. I'm going to be holy as he is holy. I'm going to live with a faith that is just as precious in his sight as it is in mine for the eternal inheritance that he has been willing to give to us. You are precious in God's sight. One of the things that is so important to me, anytime I talk about this type of subject, is for us to understand how much God loves you. How precious you are to him. We talk so often about we live in a society, we live in a culture, it's humans at its core, that we're selfish and we're willing to put down other people. And we compare ourselves to other people, and quite frankly, you just come up a little short and don't realize how precious you are, how unique you are, how loved you are. In first John, or excuse me, first Peter, Peter continues the conversation here, talking about this one, what Jesus was willing to do for us. He starts off this chapter by talking about the kindness that we have, that we grow in respect to salvation. In verse 4, he says, In coming to him as to a living stone which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. And I want you to think about that verse. Man rejected it. God says it's precious. Our God tells us about our Savior. He's precious. He'll go on here in verse 6, talking about as the, uh, Isaiah will mention, Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value, then, is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this stone, this became the very cor cornerstone, and the stone of stumbling, a rock of defense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were also appointed. You have a choice of whether or not God is truly precious. Whether or not he is worth being built upon. And then you come to verse or chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. One of the things that I think is so profound in this book is what changing our perspective of how we view things that are precious. And I want you to notice, in the midst of these verses, you might be like, Scott, I think you're reading the wrong verses. I'm not. So let's read. In the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. As they observe your chaste and respectful behavior, your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of your heart with the imperishable quality of the gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God which is precious in the sight of God. How we live shows 
whether or not we care of what God views to be precious. There will be people that would read these verses and say, well, man would never view that to be precious. Why would I ever do that? Because God says it's precious. It's precious in his sight, a gentle and quiet spirit. How we live our lives, even in the midst of persecution as they were in the first century, matters to God. I want you to notice Isaiah 43. We read verses 2, or 1 and 2 often. But if you turn with me to Isaiah 43 and verse 4. God simply says, since you are precious in my sight, since you are honored, I love you. I will give other men in your place and other peoples in exchange for your life. I love this verse for many reasons. Obviously, he's talking to Israel, his chosen people, but the principle applies. You are precious in his sight. I love you, God says. Understand your value, not in what you've done from the work standpoint or an earning standpoint, but because he is your creator. He wants to be your father. You are precious in his sight. And he loves you. Never forget that. In Psalm 116, God understands, obviously, our lives, the difficulties that we go through, and ultimately, when it comes to our death. The psalmist says in 116, verse 15, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. There is tremendous comfort when one who goes on before us, one who passes away, one that was a child of the living God, is precious to him. Takes them home. For eternity. You are so precious to him. That's never the question. The question for all of us simply is, what is precious to you? What is precious to you? There's a lot of ways you can answer that question, for sure. A lot of good things. But the number one thing has to be our relationship with our God. The faith that we have him, in him, the blood that he was willing to offer for us, the value that he puts on us, and how precious it is that we can call ourselves children of God. The difficulty is, God has given us free will to answer that question. And not everyone's going to answer that question the way that God would want. And it's in our actions. It's in how we live. Do we live a life that shows that he is precious to us, that it shows the joy that we have, not because of the circumstances we're in, but because of our relationship with him? A life that is striving to serve him, to please him, to be with him for eternity. That's the question. What's precious to you? If you need to obey the gospel, now's the time. There is no question that time is precious to us, for sure. And it needs to be. We need to understand how much value we need to put on our time that we've been given. But we need to understand how precious eternity is. And the decision that we make. And where we're going to spend eternity. It's up to you. It's up to me. It's a choice that we all have. If you need to obey the gospel, now's the time. As always, make sure you're praying for one another, looking out for one another, encouraging one another, as we're striving to have this relationship with God and to help one another get to heaven. But if there's anything that we can do for you,